Greetings, great people. My name is Dr. Scholar Lee. Welcome to the Gender Docu-Series. This docu-series was created to educate, elevate, and empower society to evolve when it comes to affirming the identities of the transgender non-conforming community. I also created this docu-series in the memory of the transgender non-conforming individuals who have lost their lives. If you are interested in interviewing and or sponsoring this docu-series, please send me an email. My contact information is above. And with that being said, great people continue to be great, be be bold and always, always be you. Enjoy the interview. Peace. Hello, oh, um, my name is uh, Dr. Dionuni. Um, my pronouns are they, um, though I accept he as well. Um, I am born and raised in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, however, I live in Maryland, right outside DC right now. Awesome, awesome. Okay, um, Dean, so tell, t- tell us about yourself. Uh, sure. Um, so again, born and raised in Alabama, um, one of four. Uh, pretty humble beginnings, I would say, living in, you know, um, more country rural area. Um, I was diagnosed with autism pretty early on in, um, in, in my life. Uh, so always kind of was different when it came to social interactions and especially in school and things like that. So um, being exposed to therapy and all that pretty, pretty early on. Um, fast forwarding to, you know, um, getting older, I ended up joining the military where I served for about five years. Um, um, I'm a medically retired um, veteran right now. Um, ended up getting into consulting, um, and which is kind of what I've done for my most of my career um, in the tech space. So I do a lot of um, business analysis, user experience strategy, people operations, and things like that, um, which allowed me to kind of travel a lot. I've lived in a lot of different areas, both in the military and as a consultant. I learned a lot, um, been around a lot of different type of people, um, have married right now um have two children one was just born a few weeks ago so pretty excited about that um yeah and that's kind of a fast forward to me right now i mean i have a phd in organizational psychology um and uh, currently a chief experience officer of a um, federal it agency well 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 okay You're definitely uh, highly successful, which is great because I, um, you know, especially being um, a black man of trans experience, you know what I'm saying? I think this is definitely empowering because it's going to set a very positive example to our youth um, and a representation of our community for sure. Yeah. So I just thank you for all your achievements and all you represent and, um, you know, putting us as a, a community on the map for sure. Of course. Um, yeah, no yeah. So, you know, um, I'm a family individual, so let's, let's, let's talk about how, how, how is it, how's family life, you know, um, with, you know, your children, your wife. So let's talk about that. Uh, sure. So, um, I would say first it was kind of, it was a little more challenging. Um, so this is my second marriage, my first marriage. Um, I got married as a teenager, um, while in the military kind of, you know, it was, you know, your first relationship, and you think it's going to be forever type of deal, you know, um, but it was, you know, not very healthy. And um, she definitely had her own, you know, mental health issues and challenges that I took on. Um, and my son was conceived during that time and realized that it just wasn't a very good environment for either him or me. Um, and so it was actually funny during my time of realizing that I was not non-binary and I'm um, focusing on myself, my own personal development, you know, realizing that I didn't like the person who I was, or I just didn't feel comfortable with the person I was. It actually helped me to kind of look externally look at the relationship with those and say, you know what, this doesn't line up with who DM is. Um, so I ended up, you know, again, t- and focusing more on self development and my own, you know, um, journey through, you know, my gender identity and what I wanted to be and all that stuff. And it turned out that, you know, that relationship wasn't for me. So I ended up leaving it and being, you know, kind of myself. And that's how I actually uh, met my, my current wife. Um, 
And since then, you know, like since I found it's not just a relationship, but since, you know, being true to myself and, you know, really understanding who I was, um, it helped me to attract the people who would accept me for who I am, you know, and um, and definitely got a lot better. So, you know, my current marriage, you know, we've been married for a while, a few years and and it's amazing. And I think that we're really aligned. And, you know, we like I said, we just had our second um, child um, a few weeks ago. Um, my wife actually two days ago, uh, formally adopted my son. And, um, so, you know, we're, we're definitely, things are a lot better, more stable for our children and, and even for us. So, man, um, there was some key you said there, uh, you know, how your past relationship, how you took on those mental health challenges. It reminded mm-hmm. me of my past relationship with my daughter's mother, how mm-hmm. toxic it was, you know, I, it was verbally, physically abusive. Yep. Um, it, it, it was a lot. And, you know, when, when you talk about loving yourself, that's where I had to go because I also was transitioning in my last relationship, too. I had just found out about the uh, transgender nonconforming community and yeah. how affirmed I felt, you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, man, I, I could definitely relate to that experience. Um, so uh, you, you said that, you know, you had your child from your past relationship. So what was that process like when it came to your, you know, getting custody of your son? Sure. Um, it, it was definitely a challenge, but more so with me and the other parent, um, as far as, you know, I had to, of course, you know, prove there, there was negligence, child negligence, and prove that there were some, you know, issues there by clicking all of these police records and mental health, you know, reports and all that stuff. And then, um, I had to present it in front of a judge and, you know, and kind of plead my case and say, you know, that the biggest thing too, was could I financially afford, you know, to support a child by myself, which at the time I, I could, so it wasn't, you know, something I necessarily had to struggle with too much. Um, but also providing a stable household. So the biggest, that was probably the big challenge for me is because I, as a consultant, as I mentioned, I moved a lot for my roles. Um, so I had to say, okay, I need to pick somewhere I'm going to live. I'm going to take something, a more long-term contract. I'm going to just say, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to say, this is where I'm at. Um, and that was a uh, kind of difficult for me considering how much I moved around and, and that was something that was coming for me. So um, I did have to stabilize quite a bit in order to show that I had that stable environment for him to, to thrive in. And I realized it was good for him anyway. You know, he never stayed anywhere for very long because we, we moved so much and I realized that it wasn't really good for him either with, you know, his instable, the instability of his, you know, his one other parents and her mental condition, but then me physically moving around. So um, that was probably the biggest thing was finding. So I settled in Maryland, realized this is where we're going to stay, got a house. And that made the transition as far as the custody and, you know, eventually the termination of her parental rights a lot easier. So that was kind of the transition from that. And it was completely separate though, once, you know, I was married and getting her, you know, with the adoption, those are kind of two different processes. Mm. Was the was like the adoption process for your wife more smoother than the hurdles oh. you had to jump through? <laughs> um, somewhat, yeah. I mean, we still had well because the so the first process was more around me gaining full custody, right? But she still with is his parent. You know, I can't just say you know she's gone. So that that was really the me trying to convince a judge that I was suitable for having full custody. I didn't require any child support from her or anything. It was just like I just maintain full custody. Um, no, it was a completely separate thing to get her rights terminated, um, in which we had to kind of, you know, engage with her and kind of not negotiate, but like rationalize with her and say, you know, this is the best interest of Dad Daxon. You haven't seen him in years. And, you know, we were trying to provide him to with family. So we had to work closely with her. And, you know, of course, you know, paperwork done. That was another completely different thing to get her terminated. And then for it, then after that it was easy because then I have to agree, which of course I'm going to agree. And then we had to get, you know, more of just pipe paperwork. Like we had to prove that he's, you know, healthy and happy. And we'd prove that we'll set is healthy and happy and, and things like that, which we have, of course, you know, because it's it's true. So I would say that the complexities of the process for full custody was proving that I was competent and able and stable and that she was negligent. And then for the adoption for Lisette was more so getting the other parent or my ex-wife to agree to, you know, do so. Um, and for some us, she didn't want to have her own child support and she kind of moved, she lives in a different state. And again, she's not mentally well and she, she's aware of that and she acknowledges that. Um, that's why I have no hard feelings towards her. I know like she just has her own journey to, to kind of go through. Yeah. And um, so that was kind of how it went. And again, kind of I finally cleared chapter after several years, um, a couple of days ago. Mm. Well, congratulations. And, um, you know, I, I humbly thank you just for providing a safe environment for your child. 
Because, I mean, yeah. you know, life happens. You know what I'm saying? Not all of us are dealt certain cards. So yeah. um, that's that's a blessing that your wife, you know, embraces your son as well. Um, yeah. and, and you three, you know, as his parents, were able to come to this decision that was best for him. So yeah. That's, that's, blessed. That, that's a blessing. So can you describe or, or, you know, tell us what your experience is like with your family? Um, how's that? <clears throat> my experience with my key people over specific? Yeah, yeah, like you know, your your blood family, your mom, your oh, siblings. Like my, I see. Um, yeah, so. uh, sure. Um, well, not very good. <laughs> um, well, it, honestly, it was. It's not necessarily related to like who I am and and all of that with me, non-binary and all that stuff. It actually is more just simply when what I've learned is when you focus on your own, when you love yourself, when you focus on your own growth, you know, it does require a a lot of. Um, it requires you to assess a lot of relationships that may not be very healthy for you, which mm-hmm. sometimes are not, you know, everyone's like, oh, it must be like a toxic boyfriend, but it also could be a toxic mother. It could be a toxic sibling and things like that. Um, and that's, so that's one thing is simply assessing the the value and the nature of the relationship. But then another thing is, is when you're focusing on yourself and you're truly loving yourself and building self-awareness development, you also outgrow a lot of things that, you know, before you suited you, but don't anymore. And so what I found was that that happened with my family in, in that they were pretty stagnant in what they believe is pretty stagnant in what they were doing and their habits, their very bad habits, uh, you know, and, and the lifestyle that they were living. It didn't align with where I wanted to go and where who I was anymore. Um, I oftentimes who they, they would use me the more I, you know, excelled, especially financially, um, coming from a family that didn't have much, um, I took on the role as an ATM, essentially, where they kind of cash out whenever they need something. Um, and I realized that, again, I wasn't really in alignment with, with who I was and how I want to be treated anymore. Um, and so it, literally exactly the same time that with my ending, separating from my pre- previous marriage, exactly that same year, it was in 2017, I would say it was really pivotal for me, it was, it was shifting quite a bit. But um, I, I ended up, I basically told them, like, like, I'm not giving you money anymore, and I don't want that to be a relationship anymore. And they naturally stopped reaching out to me mm-hmm. um, because it was no longer what, you know, didn't really suit them anymore, in which I had to come terms with. I knew that if I put that ultimatum up there, that was a potential, and I accepted that that was what happened. You know, what I love about that is the fact that you accepted. I mean, because I totally get, you know, Trent transition and honestly like saved my life I felt like it, it allowed me to um embody all of me accept all of me and I sure. started to become unapologetic and stop compromising myself to make other people comfortable um yeah. and and like you stated I had the same experiences like people just naturally uh re- eliminated themselves just, exactly, yeah, you don't right. have to do much work yeah, yeah. <laughs> be you and people kind of clear out <laughs> But it also, but as they clear out, though, what I would say, though, is, again, with, like, my wife, as they clear out, new people come in who, again, who accept you. So being you is the best thing you can do because the more you hide, you're going to attract the wrong people, and they're going to stay around you when, in reality, being you is the best thing that you can do for getting the, those people around you who are going to be there, support you, love you for who you are. Yes. I mean, and I hope everybody heard that. Being you is the best thing you can do. Okay. Really, somebody, yeah. make a, somebody make a, uh, um, a song about that. I'll play it. Uh-huh. Um, so <laughs> so um, tell us what your experiences was like, um, like transition and how positive it's been in your life. <clears throat> sure. Um, I would say initially it was, it initially was somewhat challenging, not for me, because I'm more indifferent to the perspectives or the opinions of others. But just to be honest, I just I don't have emotional attachments towards social norms and things like that because of my autism. Um, but I would say that I definitely noticed the differences in reactions to like how people interact with me. Uh, what I mean so is, is that with me, I'm very gender fluid as far as some people, they, they assign my gender, right? Because I'm indifferent to what you assign me, to be honest. Um, and during during the time in which I was first kind of exploring this whole idea of being non- non-binary, um, so I was working. I was working in one organization, and I worked with their HR team and organization development team. Right, that was I was a consultant for them. And one day, I would dress really or be present very feminine, right, like extremely so. And then the next day would be more masculine, and they're just like, 
what is like, I don't even know what, how to interact with you. I don't know how to address you. I don't know what to say to you. Um, and so it was the nonconformity aspect that, especially when I was, you know, you're trying to get your footing, you're trying to figure out who you are, you're trying to figure out how do you express your gender. Um, it was a lot of like, you know, that's not okay here, you know, and the time I lived, I lived in um, Pennsylvania, a very, you know, kind of rural area on a project I was working on. So I realized that my environment was not very accepting of who I was. So it was very important to me that when I did choose where I was going to live, you know, a stable environment for my son, that I chose somewhere that I felt that I could be me. And it didn't feel like I was constantly being, you know, evaluated or judged or treated differently, which is another reason why I moved to Maryland, um, because of the area is just a lot better for, you know, core acceptance there. Um, but that was probably the biggest thing that I feel like I faced well consciously was the fact that as I kind of, because I don't follow a, a um, I guess like the typical, you have to dress like this, you have to do these things, you have to act like this, talk like this all the time. Um, in mind, so even now to this day, I kind of sways. I remember I joke about it all the time. They're like, um, like as far as because people, you know, they'll look at me and like, oh, you're really masculine and you're like this macho person or whatever. And uh, but but she knows me is like, you know, like I'm always one like gardening and you know, I'm actually you know a lot more. I guess what people associate traditionally with more feminine qualities in couples and relationships, it actually is me. Like I'm the one who cares about the house and the, and the cleaning and things like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 like it's like everything that's associated with it. Like she just doesn't care about it, and us. And I'm like, no, this is really important to me. And you know, like you have to listen. And and, and even yeah, so sometimes the way that I ex uh, uh, present physically as well, like um, I know that you know. But again, because of I'm simply being who I am, I attracted those individuals who are accepting and completely okay with that. You know, with me. Um, and that's what I found to be the case with anyone who's transitioning or anyone who's self-discovering. I kind of like call it self-discovering more than transitioning because it, it is a transition. You're transitioning, but you transition a lot in your life from any given thing. You know, you're transitioning from, again, from negative toxic relationships to healthier ones. But it, the point of it and what you're truly doing is self-discovery. You're discovering who you are and then you're acting on it. You're saying, I realize who I am and I'm going to go out and act on it. And in that process for me. It was the same as, again, any other thing in my life where I was like, this is who I am. So I'm going to be it. I'm going to be loud about it. I'm going to do it. And this is simply who I am. And then organically, those relationships either increase for some people or decrease for others. Um, and they could be work related relationships because I realized I didn't I wasn't good in that relation. The one in Pennsylvania, I was like, I can't. This is not where I want to be. I can't continue engaging where I'm being othered or I'm not They're They're jumping over my head or they're you know saying these comments to me or I can't do my job effectively anymore. My productivity was being impacted. So I, I did. I left that organization and, and, you know, went to another contract. Um, again, it could be relationships, you know, whether it be for your family or friends, um, colleagues, it could be schools. Um, I realized that I had to continuously evaluate how I was, you know, being treated or how I was interacting with others until it fit, felt good to me. I'm like, this is, I feel comfortable here. Being me, then I can be me here. Um, and that's, that's, that was my transition. I feel like was that constantly trying to say, I'm being me right now today. Where can I do that most comfortably? And where do I feel like I best um, can be me without judgment, without, you know, all this other extra stuff that I don't need to deal with? Yeah, no, I love that. Like the self-discovery analysis that you, you know, just explained. Um, how can I be me and what environment will create a safe place for me to exactly. be me? Um, exactly. I, I think that is, and I hope a lot of people heard that too. Um, yeah. Because that, that's really important. Everyone. Yeah. So like, how did you, how were you able to manage, I should say, you know, because, you know, with being autistic and trying to self-discover, mm -hmm. you describe, you know, what, what obstacles or challenges that you had to be resilient through? Sure. Um, mm, I would say uh, to some degree, there's a medical aspect, you know, of increasing going to, you know, therapy and making sure that, you know, you're good because throughout a transition of any kind, especially one around your gender, um, it's important to stay solid as far as your mental health. You know, you're going through a lot. And even if you don't realize you are sometimes, maybe you're subconsciously or you're put, you know, pushing it down and bottling it up. You know, there's a lot going on. You know, again, all these people treating you differently, all these people maybe rejecting you, all the people judging you, maybe leaving your life. That could take a toll on, you know, anyone. Um, so it was that to think about, well, I'm like, well, let me let me make sure I'm working through my mental health to make sure that I'm good there. Um, there is the aspect, of course, of being a single parent, you know, time, you know, while this is going on, I was like, well, um, how do I balance, you know, self-discovery and focusing on myself, which is a very selfish act, 
but also being the sole provider for this child who can't fend for themselves. So it's like this balancing act of being selfishly involved in yourself to know who you are and pour into yourself, but you also do have to pour into others. So like, how do you balance that out was something that was challenging, uh, you know, an issue for me. It was my first kid. It's not like I was, the, you know, seasoned. So it was, um, it was, he was so young, only two years old. So that was definitely very challenging. In addition to trying to figure out where I was living and my progress project and growing my business, I was a grad student at the time. Um, it was just, it was a lot going on at the time. So the idea of continuously evaluating and um, your environment and seeing who accepts you is, it sounds good in theory, but it's also very, very challenging to continuously move. Because if, if you're saying, this is my criteria, if I'm going to be me, I'm going to feel comfortable if this and this happens. You have to then I'll consider that it may not happen, which if it just happened, that means you're saying I'm going to move or I'm going to leave the situation. And you may have to do that quite a bit of time before you figure out where you're comfortable. And that happened with me. I am now comfortable with my current marriage, my current relationship. But there are many other relationships, you know, or other interactions with other individuals between that, of course, and where I lived. Well, it didn't just magically say this is exactly the, the location I'm going to be at. I had to keep maneuvering and figuring out where, where do I feel comfortable and where don't I feel comfortable? Where can I be myself? Jobs, the same thing, you know. So the challenge really is, is that you have to set your boundaries, set your expectations and say, this is this is what I want for my life and define success for yourself. But then the challenges come in is you have to then be willing to uphold your own boundaries and most, most people don't they'll say this is my boundary this is what i want and then they'll get something else and go well i mean i guess i'll accept it because i don't have the other choice mm. no you have one but it's a very big challenge and there's a lot of so, dis, discipline required for you to act on those boundaries and say no i'm, I'm gonna have to if i believe this job and it has job security well i guess i'm gonna believe because i'm not accepting what you're doing to me i, I can't live in this neighborhood because you guys are really homophobic or really you know discriminatory i guess i'm gonna have to pick up and leave and moving is hard but i'm, I'm gonna do that you know, and relationships, again, if these people aren't treating you with respect, guess I'm not to cut you off, even though you're fun or even though I don't, I'm going to feel lonely or and things like that. That's really the biggest challenge that I would say comes with, you know, the self-discovery transitioning period, um, for sure. It's it's you have to set the clear boundaries and expectations to define success of your transition for yourself. And it can it can be really hard to do that. Yeah, Um I like I like how you said that, like, you know, just pretty much confront, confronting the adversity instead of running away from it. Exactly. Um, yeah. And pretty much, you know, taking taking a bull by the horns and, mm -hmm. you know, just not settling, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. nothing should be exceptional when it comes to your boundaries. Even mm -hmm. you shouldn't be breaking your own boundaries towards yourself. Exactly. You know? exactly. So, which is a challenge to do so. It's easier to fold. It, honestly, it is. People want to say like that, but it is much easier just to settle. It's much easier to say, okay, well, all right, I'll accept it this time. And it becomes over and over again that you're accepting it, which is what leads most people, especially, you know, uh, who are transitioning to, to say, well, I guess I'll just take this talk to relationship. I don't feel like I have anyone else. No one's going no to love me. Or I'm going to take this job because no one's going to hire me. I'm going to take this house because no one else is going to let me live here. You know, like, we settle a lot because we feel like we have no other choice and we don't set clear boundaries. We don't set clear, we don't define success for ourselves, which is, I always tell people it's very, very critical. You, you have to say what success is to you, not to anyone else, but to you. And then align every boundary, every expectation around that. And it, it's not easy though. It's not an easy thing to do. It's easier to let someone else tell you what it is and say, this is what success looks like. This is what you got to do. And then just kind of go through the motions. And I mean, you said that best because it's easy to follow, right? It's easy for somebody it is very to tell easy you to where to be, where to go, so you don't have to think, right? It's hard mm -hmm. to think and then trust Except yourself. This, this, that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So can you describe what success means to you? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll explain it from the framework. Because again, I'm being honest, I look at everything frameworks. And it's something actually I um, have taught to a lot of my coaches because um, I was a, a coach. I'm a psychologist, but I was a coach for a while. But um, I break them up into five components and I call them your 2.0s. But essentially, I require that you name them. So um, um, there are five components. So it's what do you want to do? What do you want to do is not just about your job. What do you want to, most people think, oh, I want to do be this the job title, right? But your identity is not always tied to what you do in your job. You should not because jobs come and go. You can fire tomorrow and now your identity is crashed. So what do you want to do is really just like if you woke up in the morning, what do you physically like? What do you want your day to be filled with? Right. It could be volunteering. It could be religious based. It could be it could be your job. It could be whatever. Right. So what do you want to do? So define that. Then you define who's in your life. This could be colleagues or type of colleagues. It could be um 
a relationship, an intimate relationship, or a friendship relationship. It could be children. You may not want my, you know, I want to have children. I want five children, right? Define that. Who's in your life? Your parents? Do you want them in your life? Yes or no? And then um, another one would be where do you want to live? And it's really critical that you think about that because simply living anywhere is not ideal. Like, where do you want to live in this state? Do you want to live in this city? Do you want to live in this neighborhood, this community? Do you want to live in a house, an apartment, a box, right? You, as part of your definition of success, where, where are you physically? It's very important to live on a beach, in the mountains, uh, in isolation. Um, the other one is um, who, do you make, who do you want to make an impact on? So I think this is critical because most people kind of live to kind of barely make money and whatever. But who you make an impact on? Like, do you want to focus on your children? Like, you know, like I really want to make an impact on my children. So I want to be in their lives 24 seven as much as possible. Or do you have a passion for a job? Like, do you want to do you want to help a certain group of people? Like, if I'm a psychologist, who do I really want to help? In mine, I will really want to help employees, right? So it's like I have a passion for this. So I want to impact on them. It takes this up further from what you're simply doing to why you're doing it, and it's important to you know to really define that. And then last one, and your fifth one is, what's your financial situation? So everyone says, I'm going to be a millionaire, right? It's just a generic thing you say. But honestly, when that's just someone else telling you what success is, someone else told you millionaire is successful. You need to say financially, what would I be content with? Like if I had this in the bank, if I had this annually, if I felt like I could achieve these things with my life because of what money I have. This would be this is what it looks like. That could be a number. It could be again a, a salary. It could it differs because if different people it looks differently. They got passive income sources. Like if I have this passive income source, I'm good. But it really helps you to understand kind of what it looks like for you and what you're trying to attain from certain activity that you do. Because you everyone needs money to live, obviously, and it kind of just helps you scope it. So you're not just again everyone's not trying to be a millionaire. The thing about those five is that they're not separate. They all have to align to each other. Where you live directly impacts who's in your life. Because if you live in the middle of the mountains, maybe you limit now who's in your life, obviously. Yeah. And also, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it also limits It also limits what, what you do because if you're in the mountains, you're not going to beach every day. You see, so they actually, you have to think about them all together. Um, and it gives you this big picture of this is who my 2.0 is. This is what I'm working towards. So for me in my instance, um, my very first one, I did it for me. You know, Before I coached anyone, I did it myself again during my per- period of transition. It's actually, that really was the starting point for me. I wrote these out during my period of transition. And said, okay, my relationship seems pretty toxic. And I hate, I lived in New York at the time and I hated living there at first. Like, I hate this place. It's awful. Um, um, and actually, it was, it was Buffalo, New York, though, not even New York City. I lived in New York City before, but I was in Buffalo, New York at this point. And I just felt like this, my work was bad. And I just, I hated everything about what was going on. So I was like, I broke it up into those things. So let me define these for myself. And I was like, well, let me name it something. I need to name it something so I, it's real. You know, who am I becoming? Who am I transitioning to, right? And mine was Dr. Diem. That's actually why I call myself Dr. Diem. It's not a, this pretentious thing that I'm like, I just want everyone to have PhD. It was actually because at the time I did not have PhD. I had zero degrees, no degree at all. <laughs> and, and it was 2016 and I, and I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm leaving the military. I, well, I just got in the military and I don't have any money. I'm, you know, I was, I was a two-year-old. I'm in a whole marriage. What am I supposed to do? And I feel like I know I'm not binary or I'm learning that I'm not binary, but how do I truly identify with that and how it looked like I was all over the place. So I broke it into these five categories and then defined each of them for myself. So I realized what I want to do. I was like, you know what? I really want to be, I want to be a good father. I want to make sure that that's what I'm focusing on. And I don't know necessarily that I can do that right now because again, I'm all over the place, my gender, I'm all over the place, my identity. I don't have the social um, cues or, or the skills to do so. So I need to focus more, you know, on therapy so I can do that right now. I also knew that I wanted to be a psychologist. I was like, I want to be a psychologist. And everyone's like, how are you going to do that? Like, you don't have any <laughs> education or anything. Like, you're not going to be a psychologist. And you're in the military for intel. And I'm like, I'm going to be a psychologist. Like, that's what I want to do. And I want to, that's really what's important to me. And so then it went to um, who's in your life? Well, again, I'm like, not my, my current <laughs> wife. <laughs> not her. No, it just didn't fit in. It just didn't align. You know, I was like, this is not working. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, but I really do want my son in my life, which is started the custody thing. I was like, you know, I really want my son in my life. I like, guess it's important to me. I want to make sure that I can take care of him. Um, I realized again, my family, a lot of my blood family, nope, that they, they weren't fitting in. Um, but it was one single friend. I had only like one friend who was actually from Alabama, um, who was, you know, who's always supportive of me. He checked in on me. And this is this really weird, like kind of pen pal situation because we've never lived in the same state since high school, but we've always stayed in contact. But he does, like, you know, he, you know, he's someone I think is solid. So he did. Um, then going into um, where I want to live. Again, not in Buffalo, New York. I hated that place. The snow was just awful. I was like, but I really want to live somewhere that was inclusive, somewhere that was more that was more um, predominantly black. I was like, you know, I feel like I don't be I don't want to be isolated anymore. I don't want to feel like I'm the only one. I don't. Um, so that was really important to me. Um, 
And so again, ended up being DC and then, or outside DC in Maryland. And then um, was the, who do I make an impact on? Again, my passion has always been for um, helping with um, employment, especially those of people of color. So I'm um, helping with through investments, like I'm helping, I invest in their, their tech startups. I um, like to help with finding employment. So I have, I've helped a new, so many people find jobs and like helping them through my connections like that. Cause I was, Hey, great people. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I want to take a brief moment to thank our sponsors. Please know your contribution helps maintain and sustain this platform. I want to thank 50 Faces Podcast, AJ Bakes, Aristocrat Intelligence, Be Down Enterprises, Divine Divine Co., Dr. Scholar Lee, LLC, Greenlight Workplace Solutions, Omega Tree Trust, LLP, and Transparent Life Conversations, LLC. And I want to take a brief moment to specially thank sponsor 50 Faces Podcast. The 50 Faces Podcast tells the stories of extraordinary people and exploring ideas through podcasts. It creates a library of diverse role models who tell their career stories because you can't be what you can't see. And a special thank you to Transparent Life Conversations, LLC, whose purpose and mission is to make sure the identities of transgender non-conforming individuals are affirmed and they experience a healthy transition that adds to their well-being and quality of life. They help parents of transgender children cope and overcome the challenges they experience being a parent of a gender expansive child. Also, Transparent Life Conversations serve organizations to help create trans-inclusive work environments to ensure transgender non-conforming employees thrive in the workplace. Please visit www.transparentlifeconversations.com to learn more about services and or to schedule a free consultation. You may also email inquiries to info at transparentlifeconversations.com. Lastly, if you're interested in donating and or being a sponsor, please email info at drscholarleeexperience.com. You can send donations to Cash App, which is dollar sign Dr. Scholar Lee, PayPal, which is at Dr. Scholar Lee, and or you can use the email for PayPal and Zelle, which is info at drscholarlee.com. I thank you so much in advance. All right, great people. Let's get back to the interview. The passion of mine to help people, you know, to feel good and, and financially stable. Um, and then what's my financial situation? So time again, I was broke and I was living off my um, VA and I was like, you know what? I want to, I want to be debt free. That was really big for me because the time I had debt. Um, and I don't want to never have debt again. I want to be able to be a homeowner that's not, you know, suffering under a mortgage. So it's like, I want to be able to pay my house off. And, you know, that's just really important to me. Um, I was like, and I want to be able to have, a, a finances that are uncomfortable where I can retire at 40. So I didn't have a millionaire status. I just like, I want to be able to retire or look completely and not have to work when I want to by 40. That was my financial goals. So I'm structuring that way so that people can kind of hear examples. Like it doesn't mean you have to have an exact number. It's just your lifestyle. What does that look like for you? Mm-hmm. And so that, and I named that person at that point, again, 2016, just beginning my transition, just beginning all of this stuff, Dr. Diem. And so that's why when I do my LinkedIn post, I hashtag Dr. Diem, because to me, that is my 2.0 level. That, that was who I was trying to be. And it finally happened. It took years, but it I, it came to be. And that's who, that's who Dr. Diem is to me. And I love the fact that you use examples because so people can get in, you know, get more of um, an understanding of what what it'll look like for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah, your your overall goal, right? You overall goal might be to get to the mountain or to make that million dollars. But what Mm -hmm. what what do you know when you break it up in segments like that? I mean, because you said 2016. I mean, what are we uh, six years later? You know what I mean? And, And how much all that you know, was brought into fruition. So the fact that you was able to analyze and actually ask these questions that I like, because they're questions that allow you to think that actually, you know, trigger thought. So you could mm-hmm. be creative, you know, in your yep. imagination. And it's kind of exactly. like a mental vision board, right? I love yeah, it really board. is. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I love vision boards. I actually make those, but, <laughs> you know, but, but it helps me, you know, uh, it empowers me at some days, mm-hmm. you know, when my reality is not looking like how I want it, it makes to it more objective as well. It makes it more objective. Right. Right? Objective. It's not like this hypothetical up in the air, you know, like blue sky, everyone's going to be great. Mm-hmm. You know, you're saying you're setting actual metrics. You're saying this is 
you have, when you're setting this, it, you should be able to ask yourself in a year from now, have you reached this goal? Yes or no. It should be that clear. If you say, oh yeah, I'm mean rich. You can never really answer that yes or no, because what is rich, right? You have to establish as in, did this actually happen? So if I'm saying I'm going to be debt free, I can say yes or no, I'm not debt free. There's no, there's no ambiguity there. Either I am or I'm not. Your goal should be set to be that way. If I'm saying I want to be a psychologist, Right. And the criteria being psychologists is to have a PhD, have a license or and have whatever role. Did I do that? Yes or no. You know, there is. So it is important that when you're thinking about this, it's not these flowery, you know, whimsical, whatever. It should be something that you can do, like completely say yes or no that you've been able to do. And that's what kind of makes it objective and something that's more tangible. And it also kind of structures your path, right? Exactly. It, yeah. it, it, it refines your movement and it a lot creates this path for you that you Absolutely. okay. When you ask these questions, now you got to think of okay, what what actions do I need to take to achieve? It, yes, exactly. That's exactly what we do. So again, it's like I think it's funny because the thing that made me so different, especially growing up, being autistic and looking at everything so structured. I look at everything like this. Like even people think my I run my mirrors like a business because I look at I just how I look at the world, right? Um, because I'm I don't necessarily have the emotions to to sway me one way or the other i look at everything very calculated and as funny because that's that very same mindset that i was kind of scrutinized growing up for is what makes me successful now but because yeah. um, <laughs> everyone's like i want less emotions i want more of what you're doing but yeah. essentially it's what it is so when you have your 2.0 what you're supposed to do is you've now defined your goal i always kind of use a description of this when you want, say you want to go across the country, right? So you want to go to, say you want to go, I want to travel. That's a broad thing to say, I want to go travel. But you're like, someone's going to ask you, oh, where do you want to go? First question that people ask you, where do you want to go, right? Well, that's exactly what you're doing now. By your two point, you're saying, this is where I want to go. Because you can't get anywhere. No one's going to be able to help you provide accommodations. No one's going to even know what you're talking about. You don't even know what you're talking about if you don't say where. So basically, your two point is your address. Because if you were to put something in GPS, right, and you say, I want to go travel. Your Google's been like, eh, okay, and what you want me to do with that, you know? But if you put an address in, like you say specifically, I want to go to this address, right? Guess what's going to be generated? A map. It's going to have directions, turn by turn. It's even going to tell you how long it's going to take you, right? It's going to tell you, take you detours. It's going to tell you traffic patterns. It's going to literally map out for you. But you couldn't do that until you put your location. Your 2.0 is your location in which then at that point you can say, all right, my location is this. It's going to take me four years to really do it. If you have a timeline that's like, okay, well, I'm not going to push it. I'm not going to rush myself because I can take breaks because I know in four years I'm going to get there as long as I do these things. And I can um, take this turn because it's going to it's the right choice for me. I'm going to take this job because it's heading me to the right direction. I'm not going to take this job because it's not in the right direction. I'm not going to let this person mess my life up with her toxicity because it's in the wrong direction. You're able to evaluate your choices based off of your goals. The same way you would take a right turn or a left turn when you're in a road. The same way you know it's going to be taking me ten minutes in that direction to go here. That's why you need your 2.0 because it gives you it gives you an angle. There is no plan. There's no map when there is no angle. I love that, and <laughs> I mean I just love the analogy you use. Like when you put the address in, a, ma a map is created now, and pretty mm -hmm. much when you ask yourself these questions, you're creating the map you know, in, in which you envision success and success is defined by, exactly. And, and, um, so when you, so my question would next be, um, how would you apply your 2.0 method to like the workplace, right? To create an inclusive culture, like, you know, what questions do they need to ask themselves to create inclusive cultures, not just for trans people, but you know, all walks of life. That is, that is, um, don't that's a very good question, actually. And um, how I'll go about that is it's something I've, I've worked on a similar project once before. Is it first and foremost, as anything, you need to define it, right? Every organization is to define inclus inclusivity differently. So first and foremost, you have to ground yourself in what is that? What does that actually mean to you? So what is inclusive? Um, you know, when you're focusing on inclusivity, are you focusing, like you said, on maybe um, LGBT community? Are you talking about, you know, maybe, you know, sexual orientation and gender identity? Or are you focusing more on race and race disparities? Or are you focusing on gender, right? Are you focusing on neurodiversity? Are you focusing on physical disabilities, veteran? And there's so many different branches of it that as an organization, if you just say diversity, you're not gonna actually do anything. You need to actually lean in and say, this is what you mean. And this is how you operationally define it. So operationally defining means that this is how for your purposes, you are defining it, right? You have a right to define whatever it is you mean, however you mean it. Because how is anyone going to be able to act on what you're saying when they're like, you're like, hey, go do do that inclusive stuff. And they're like, uh, OK, but like <laughs> with, with who and to who. Right. So it starts with you as an organization, you as leadership saying 
This is what inclusion means to us. And these are, you know, the, the subcategories. And this is how we define each of them. So each of them is, if we're talking about race, we're talking about these things. And then this is how we define race. And this is how we, we define our diversity, right? And from there, you're saying, uh, what is it supposed to look like? Now that you've kind of defined it broadly, well, what is like, what does the inclusive workforce look like to you and your organization? So you may say, you know, inclusive workforce looks like that, you know, we have talent pools from, you know, different types of neighborhoods of so this type of neighborhood. We get, you know, get, uh, this college and then maybe HBCUs are, you know, something we get our talent from. And we also have trainings that have this in involved and we have a high retention of this demographic. And you have to establish what does inclusive look like, right? What does inclusive workforce look like to you, right? And the problem here, though, this that comes in is that the wrong people get to define it often, right? So, like, a lot of times it's like, I'm sorry, but, you know, white cis man who in your late 40s defining what inclusion looks like for organization, it gets a little shaky, you know? It gets a little rough. <laughs> So unlike your self-awareness one or your, your, your self-discovery one where you truly can define it by yourself for an organization, it is critical, though, that you consider who is defining inclusion and make sure the right people are helping to define inclusion um, to make sure that when you do, because, again, whatever location you put in, again, Google don't care. Google, like, if you want, I'll send you to the middle of the ocean if that's where you're going. <laughs> so, Egypt. Like, <laughs> yeah, it'll, like, Google, like, turn left and you ride for the cliff, right? <laughs> Oh. When you set that address, when you set that location, make sure the right person is telling you where to go. Because <laughs> Use that, discernment, all right? <laughs> exactly. So the thing that's critical is you need to start with defining what inclusion is for your organization. But think about who's defining it and who's creating that address because everyone, like you said, is going to be following that path. Everyone's going to be kind of following along saying, oh, inclusion means this. And if inclusion means to hire one black person and one woman, guess what your organization is going to be? Inclusive with that <laughs> one black person and that one woman. So yes. that's kind of how it works. It starts though. It starts with that definition. Mm, I love that, and and having and that definition creates a vision for the organization yep. and sets the tone for the culture and the safe workplace environment. And yep. you know what does what does affirming you know care looks like you know mm -hmm. for these individuals to make an inclusive uh, co um, space. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so they take, they take every term that you make after that. Mm. I love that. And so how about this? You know, we have our parents of transgender children, right? They have their mm -hmm. obstacles on trying to find ways to, you know, love their child, affirm their child, um, those mm -hmm. that actually want to, that is. Um, sure. could, could they apply your 2.0 method, you know, to their life? Like, you know, would, would a question be like, you know, what does a healthy relationship look like between me and my child? Or, you know, sure. so how, you know, could, could your method... Sure. Be well, yeah, well, it would be a single, that would be a very single aspect of it. It would be who's in your life, right? So as a parent of someone, of a transgender child, if you want that child in your life, right? Like you said, if you can choose it, if you want that person in your life, then that then means, okay, so what does that look like, right? So you'd have to first determine as a parent, who's in my life? And you say, my child, and they are transgender, because you have to consider who your child is. Well, then in that point, the action plan as far as, well, what do you need to do to make sure they stay in your life? The support they need, the, you know, the aff affirmation they need, um, the guidance they need the resources they need, all of that are required if you are choosing consciously in your 2.0 say, this person, this child is in my life. It then again it gives you it gives you your location. Now the terms and the terms you have to make, that's it takes a little bit more effort because you just say, okay, well then if I want them in my life, well what do I need to do? What do I need to produce, you know, for them to be there? What am, what's my next turn? My next term may be education. I need to maybe to learn about more about my child and say, what does this even mean? Um, next thing could be resources available to me because again, you need to pour in yourself first. You know, you can't really support a transgender child and you don't know anything about being transgender and you don't know what resources are out there. So you need to, you know, get your resources. So your next term may be education and resources. So you may say, I'm going to go and see there's a group for transgender um, children, parents. I'm going to go join that group so I can understand more what I can do to support my child. And then you start to actually do the, the work. You see know what I'm saying? But it starts with your 2.0, which is, I want my child in my life. And that's where it's roots from. Who's in your life? And if you choose for it to be your child, then also it could also apply to who to make an impact on. Do you want to make an impact on your child? Do you want to make a positive impact on your child? Is that someone who's important to you to make an impact on? Because not every parent cares about making an impact on their children, as we all know. They barely, okay. some of them, you know. And so that's someone who you've prioritized. Like, no, I really want to make an impact on my, positive impact on my child. 
again, it goes, well, how can you do that? What does the imp positive impact look like? That could be in representation. It could be in the form of, um, you know, support of some sort, you know, um, whatever validation, whatever that looks like, it depends on your, your child. You could have a conversation with your child to figure that out and say, how can I make a positive impact on you? What does a positive impact look like to you? And things like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So those, for that example, I would say, who's in your life and who do you make an impact on? If those are your transgender children, then that's kind of where you would start mapping out, you know, your turns mm -hmm. and from there. Yeah, I, I love that. And like, actually, you know, and as you stated, you know, some of the hurdles is just asking the question, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, to leave some of yourself. Yeah, you know, ask a lot of questions and listen to them and mm -hmm. actively listen and show you care by, you know, trying your best to implement, you know, what you have been told so that you know that so that you're affirming the voice and exactly. which have given you the information. Exactly. So, um, let's talk about your experiences with the healthcare <laughs> system. We all have our unique experiences. So, can you describe your experience, you know, with um, healthcare professionals along your journey? Like working or trend as, as a patient? Um, well, just as an individual, you know, did you have affirming care with your healthcare yeah. professional? Oh, I see. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, let me see. I would say. Healthcare can be challenging for those who are transgender because, I mean, it's just limited. There's limited, you know, specialists in the first place. So I would say that in general, finding someone like a special therapist initially who specialized in the idea of gender nonconformity, nonbinarism, transgenderism, um, who I could walk, walk through and talk with and, and um, in the first place and even get a better understanding of myself was, was rather difficult at first. Um, I couldn't find anyone when I initially was in New York. I wasn't tired to move to Pennsylvania that I found a clinic, it was only one, and it, could, it was kind of far to find, you know, drive out of the way to find it. So there's always an inconvenience there, you know, like we just have so limited resources that we have to go far sometimes and, and pay high amounts if our is out of network and things like that. And that happened with me, it was out of network and all that, but I had to pay out of pocket. Um, but as far as the actual care when I was there, I mean, I would say that, it, you know, they were nice and polite. The one challenge that I found in general is that we're always looked at as, these like subjects or samples in some kind of study because we all sort of so new and the field is so unknown. So like, can we get 10 people to come in here with us while we talk to you? I'm like, every time, you know, yeah. every time it's like, you guys, you're a subject of a study. You're making like a subject of a study every, uh, in a lot of times. And, and I know that's going to be like, be very uncomfortable. You know, you want to be humanized and not feel like, a, you know, you're constantly under a microscope because you're this anomaly of a creature, you know. So I think that a lot of times with healthcare, they should really be mindful of that. And they're thinking about how they're treating, you know, I know they need data, you know, you need it. You know, it's important that, you know, you're customizing health um, care and, and interventions based off of real experiences and, and then data you collected from as a practitioner. But there is a definitely a way of in which you should do it. And I think that a lot of times, especially with transition community, they overstep and they look at us so much as just like, hey, well, we've only had five of you. So we're going to study you extensively so we can, you know, talk to the board and do this, you know. Um, so that would be one challenge, I would say. Um, I guess I would probably the biggest one is just the limit, limited access to them. Because we, we have to we have to a lot of times go very far or pay a lot more money. We only have, I only have one practitioner in this area that specializes in it. So a lot of times I have to drive, you know, either an hour up to like Baltimore or we do virtual because it's just there's just there's not really much choices. Um and then the the aspect of a lot of times because this seems we seem so different so new that we're treated like test subjects a lot of times you know like a whole like mouse or something a rat in a study um, and how the questions they, they can be very intrusive questions that are not even relevant to what we're talking about but they need the data it's like well we need the data for something else and we're like okay yeah right no seriously i i had a uh, one one guy on here uh you know said that how he just felt violated you know because yeah. they're, they're asking uh because he was a bodybuilder you know, and you're like, yeah. wow, I would have never known. Can I see your chest? Like, you know, stuff like that. Oh, like, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. to get blood work done. You need to see my chest. Yeah. You know, exactly. <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. you know, so um, what affirming, what advice would you give healthcare profession professionals to create an affirming environment for transgender nonconforming individuals? Sure. Um, I would say that affirmation and support looks differently though for different people so it's not something that you can universally say if i do this one thing it's going to always be effective and it's not going to always make someone feel affirmed so that's number one is to have open-mindedness around what that looks like 
and the uh, empathy in order to actually understand and, and do it, you know, right? So um, empathy and understanding, probably, <clears throat> probably the biggest ones, um, and flexibility. Because what I found, I mean, I, I now this is more me coming as a practitioner in healthcare. So, because again, I've done a lot of research development and helping with practitioner experience and patient experience is what I found as a patient experience expert is that, first of all, like you, you mentioned about just asking the question, you need to ask them, you know, what are you comfortable with? And what, is, what does good care look like for you? What does affirmation look like for you? What does support look like for you? Um, you know, and what needs do you think, you know, what needs need to be met? And then tailoring your treatment plan around that or tailoring your perspective around what they're saying to you. You know, I'm not saying that you can, you can just say they can come up with their, everything on their own, right? But you can frame um, questions around specifically what can be changed, right? So if you can't change that they have to come to this office, don't ask them what office they prefer because why would you ask them that? You know, clearly it's not something they can change. Like you're setting them up for failure, say, but, but things that you can change, consider, truly consider well, what can be modified in their healthcare, right? And then or what can I customize or what can I make um, accommodation for? Think about it before they come in or before you're engaging with them and say, okay, I can, I can customize how many practitioners are in the room with them. I can customize some of the questions being asked. So these questions are optional. So maybe I'll ask them about that if they feel comfortable. I can customize maybe the frequency that they're coming in, things like that, right? You can, you can figure out what you customize or we can how many, and then say, okay, now let me ask them about this. So that way in these areas, I will customize for each of my patients. Again, it's not saying that as a practitioner, you can do everything. You can't customize something that's standard. Some things have to be done in a certain way, of course, to be in compliance, but not everything. It takes you simply taking the opportunity to say, well, what can be done and what can I adjust and what can I accommodate for? Um, and so that by recommendations to practitioners as someone who really goes in and investigates practitioner and, and patient experience is I found to be the most effective way to improve patient experience and improve that um, feeling of affirmation is to assess what can be changed, what can be customized, what can be modified based off of customer needs, finding them out, identifying them, and then asking the particular patient in advance, whether it be a survey that's done beforehand with the nurse ask it, whoever, making sure that you communicate with them, hey, this is what can be changed and I'm gonna meet that, I'm gonna do that for you. And another good thing is that you could hire us type folk to be your consultant. That's another, yeah. <laughs> That's another. Actually, We're all here, okay. <laughs> that's another. That's another really big one too. Is simply having certain amount of experts to help with policy. Now, of course, that's that's ideally what you would do as well from a from a policy standpoint, because those things that can't be changed, you know, from a patient um, standpoint, could be changed if a policy above that was changed in the first place. So yes, correct. If you're looking at it from more of an organizational um, structure standpoint or a policy standpoint then yes, getting a subject matter expert in that community, especially in this community specifically, um, to say, these are conditions where I feel uncomfortable, or the, um, if this would happen, I feel more affirmed. You would be able to then establish more um, organizational wide processes and programs and interventions that would allow for that to take place across all practitioners. Amen. And what advice would you give um, our family members so they can uh, create and establish affirming relationships with their sure. gender variant loved Honestly, the same thing. I mean, it really comes in asking them. Uh, the first one, again, I think number one, though, is not just asking because if you jump in right to ask them, you're putting the responsibility on the gender affirming individual to know everything for you. And that's really not fair. They're going through self-discovery themselves. How are they going to be teaching you when they're self-discovering? So I don't think that it's necessarily appropriate to just ask them, say, hey, tell me what to do. And then if I don't, if I do exactly this, then you should be happy. Because then it's like, well, if I'm not happy, then that means I was wrong. And it's my fault that you're not making me happy. It, it shouldn't be that. It should start with you educating yourself. So it goes with you going out there, looking at the resources, doing the work to say, this is what this means. This is, uh, you know, kind of the resources that are out there that I can utilize. These are resources I can provide to my family member who's, you know, who's uh, transitioning. Um, and these are steps that I can take. You do the work yourself. And then, then once you have knowledge and you have something of value to bring to, you know, your transitioning family members, say, I know all these things. And this is kind of what I learned. And these are resources that are out there. And these are things that I can do. Now, with that, though, I want to make sure I'm still affirming you specifically or supporting you because I've heard about the people, but I want to make sure I'm aligned with you. So based off this information I have, can you kind of guide me and let me know if this is in the right direction? That would be more appropriate than just laying on them and saying, all right, well, uh, if you're going to be in my life, then, then what does that mean? What do you want me to do? What do, how, what, do, what do you mean you could say? How, what do I call you today? Like, especially because the home office is like rude a lot of times. And like, you know, you're just brushing it off. So um, educate yourself, 
figure out those resources that you need to be successful and even go take a step further and see resources that they can be successful in so you can provide value to that transitioning member and then present that information to them and say, hey, can we let's come up with a plan together. Let's figure out let's figure out that, that success together. So if I want to make an, that positive impact on you, this is important to me. Let's figure out what it looks like together. I want you in my life. What does that look like for you? Because, you know, like it may be different, you know, like I may say I want my in my life. I'm going to be every single day. They're going to be like, no, no, no. Maybe like once a week, <laughs> you know, I want to work together and figure out what it looks like. Saturdays are <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So work with them and say, you know, I'm, I've this, I've set this as my, my high level goal, but I want you to come and with help me as far as to, to refine it and clean it up a little bit and tell me what it looks like. And that's when you can set your own map and you can say right direction, left direction, and all that kind of stuff from there. Yeah, love it, love it. And I, you know, I, I, what, what, what empowering advice would you want to give our community as gender variant, gender mm-hmm. variant individuals? Um, I guess, I mean, what I've been saying, and I would always say it's, and as I say all the time on LinkedIn, it's really just self-awareness is so important. Like you truly need to know you, you need to know what your strengths are, what your desires are, your needs are. Um, because you, the thing about it is like you, people think about accommodations all the time, like, oh, accommodations, I need this and this, but by knowing who you are, knowing your limitations, limitations are not bad. Limitations simply are the extent in which you need some assistance externally to be successful. That's all it really means, right? But you don't really, you can't advocate for yourself if you don't even know what those are, right? Because then you start again, like, oh, well, I'll just accept this as normal. I, I'll just do this. You you need to build self-awareness so you know your strengths, you know your limitations, you know where you need help, you know what your boundaries are, you know where you're going, you know what your success is. So you need to find success for yourself. Starting there is really important because from there, then you get into, you know, self-management, which is learning all these new skills and going to school and fancy credentials, then you get into social awareness where now you're all in everyone else's face and empathy and all that. And, and then relationship management where you take, but it starts with that self-awareness. People skip self-awareness and go straight into social awareness and, and, Oh yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm trying to appeal to everybody. I want to make sure everyone's happy. And relationship management where you're trying to juggle in all these toxic relationships. When in reality, had you started with self-awareness, you would realize what you really wanted. You'd realize where you really were headed. You'd realize what you really needed, what you want, you know, all these things would come. So I just recommend you know, in this journey where so many people are telling you what you should be doing, what you should be like, what you, how you should dress, what you should call yourself, what, you know, telling you your pronouns, ground yourself in self-awareness, ground yourself in who you are outside of what other people are thinking and build your map around that. I don't care if it's your mom, I don't care if it's your, your partner, I don't care if it's your kid, you need to do it for you. Amen, amen. Thank you, my brother, for blessing us with your wisdom, your expertise, and I hope everybody had their pen and pad, okay? And if not, we'll watch the episode again and and, and get one, okay? (laughs) A lot of wisdom was shared on this platform. Oh, but before we uh, check out, please let uh, our audience know where to find you, how to reach you, what services you offer, all of that. Uh, sure. Well, I don't do any kind of self-promotion, to be honest. It's not really my thing. Um, but as far as, uh, I guess, finding me, um, the easiest on social media everybody have is LinkedIn. So just be my my name on LinkedIn. I think I'm like the only DM Winnie. So okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So with that being said, great people, DM, thank you so much for blessing us with your presence and your wisdom and your knowledge. Great people, thank you for your time, for listening. You know what I say, continue being great. Be bold and always, always be you. Dr. Scholar Lee signing off. Peace. are interested in making a donation to the Dr. Scholar Lee Experience podcast, you can send donations to Cash App, which is dollar sign Dr. Scholar Lee, PayPal, which is at Dr. Scholar Lee, and or you can use the email for PayPal and Zelle, which is info at Dr. Scholar I thank you so much in advance.